Okay, I'll just start off with uh, the first question uh, addressed at both of you, but I'll ask Steve first. With the New York um, de Declaration, it seems to be a very ambitious plan to stop deforestation. What do you think are the actually realistic aspects of that declaration? Well, the, of course, the declaration uh, signed by governments, private companies, NGOs, and a lot of the if you, if you will, the burden or responsibility for its implementation falls on the private sector because you know, these are large companies that produce key global economies like oil palm, sugar, beef, so on and so forth. And they're the ones who are having the direct, really significant impact on the forest landscape. And so the implementation questions that arise really fall largely to the private sector. So what's significant about the declaration, among other things, is that <coughs> A very large number of the principal uh, commodity producing companies in the, in, the, in the world signed on to the declaration. And the declaration provides, uh, really has this aim of, of having deforestation by 2020 and eliminating deforestation by 2030. So you're quite right, uh, Virginia, these are hugely ambitious kind of goals. And so lots of implementation issues arise. Now I have to say there's, there's been some experience uh, over the last 10 or 15 years or so on the part of companies and others to try to reduce the sort of impact on forests of their agricultural production practices. And so there's some lessons there uh, to be learned. Um, I, you know, one thing I might mention is the experience of, of something called the Soy Memorandum, which is a zero deforestation pledge uh, in Brazil uh, that a number of companies signed in 2006 uh, which has had the effect of really eliminating added, you know, loss of forests uh, due to uh, soy production among the companies that signed that pledge. And of course, the incentive here for the companies is that uh, in signing the pledge, they get access to global soy uh, markets. If they don't sign the pledge, then they, 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 they lose access. So there's, there's an experience with that, you know, with, with how to do that. But there's lots of questions arising in how uh, it'll, act, it'll actually sort of be implemented. And, and you know, maybe Christoph can reflect a little bit on when you think about you know, the, the kind of challenges to implementation, what are the things that come to your mind? So we are talking about pledges which are not coming into effect immediately, are giving us some time to, to kind of implement, uh, put uh, measures in place. And um, another important uh, aspect is um, that um, the companies which are making these pledges are actually, if you put them all together, they represent around 60 to 70 percent of the global uh, supply chain or trade of, of oil palm. So we are talking about a, a significant chunk of, of oil palm being traded uh, globally. And so these companies are, are pledging you know, zero deforestation over, let's say, the next 15 years. So. Um, you know, looking at it from that standpoint, you, you think, uh, yes, okay, perhaps, perhaps, perhaps this is uh, feasible. But then, um, one thing is to, to look at it and say, okay, whether it's feasible or not. But the other th uh, side of it is to say, okay, what are the implications for other players, you know, beyond, beyond these immediate uh, limited number of uh, large global players making these commitments? So, uh, and, and this is the area which is, for us, is very interesting to explore. And I think the area that um, we feel hasn't been really looked into or examined uh, sufficiently. You know, companies are making these pledges, everybody's excited, NGOs like it, governments are kind of still trying to find their position on it. On one hand, they kind of say yes, but on the other hand, okay, what does it really mean for us, for our economies? Um, but the, qu the question of implications for other players, for small and medium-sized players, smaller companies, smallholders, this is something that uh, is unexplored and we are looking into. And we have some, let's say, how shall we say this, Steve, preliminary concerns or whatever, um, that, um, you know, uh, per perhaps some, you know, sort of implementing these pledges in practice may mean excluding or sidelining some of these uh, small and medium scale actors in the oil palm agenda, in the oil palm sector. Um, and you know, that has to do with cleaning up the supply chains, ensuring, um, 
ensuring uh, deforestation, de deforestation free supply chains of oil palm and, and drawing on the, on the experience that we have from the forestry sector, looking at what, how it played out in the timber sector, we, feel, we see a lot of parallels with kind of sidelining and excluding small and medium sized players. So um, I think our interest in, uh, our concern is you know, how to ensure that that is minimized or doesn't happen. Uh, uh, doesn't happen. I'd like to get back to that smallholder aspect later because I think it's particularly interesting when you are looking at those larger corporations and the fact that their pledge may in fact exclude the livelihoods of other other people is what you're saying C4 is concerned. It so. could, it could. It We're not could. saying it will, but it could, yes. How do you investigate that? How do you make an assessment that that will be the consequence of a corporation? Uh, you know, that that is a possible consequence yeah. of a corporation signing on to the deal. Uh, it may happen. We don't know whether this will happen. I mean, it's, um, it's, uh, it's kind of an open question right now. But again, drawing on the knowledge that we have from the timber sector, from the forestry sector, looking at how the timber uh, legality verification system played out in Indonesia in the small scale sector, we, we feel that, you know, we, we may see a replay of that situation in the, in the oil palm sector. Given that it's a voluntary de declaration, that's highly likely that that could happen, given that it's not legally binding. Is there a role for governments? Obviously, there's NGO and Indigenous people kind of watchdogs and support and lobbying. But is there a role for the governments that have signed up to the declaration to be part of that process of checks and control? Oh, uh, most definitely. And the kind of social and economic questions arising for instance, if a, a large number of small producers, whether they be growers of oil palm <coughs> or, or, or marketing uh, you know, companies, you know, if they're excluded from these markets, then questions of where they market their product, what kind of price disadvantage might they face, uh, what would be the consequences to livelihoods and incomes, can be quite significant. So any government's going to be concerned about that. And so here, you know, questions arise around so safeguards, if you will, to ensure that you know, smallholders and others who have, have secured livelihoods from, from forestry or from the forest landscape or from agriculture are not disadvantaged in participating in these, in these markets. And, and you know, this is all part of, if you will, uh, an you know, important element in the certification movement. This is a form of certification. It really, this zero deforestation is an outgrowth of it's a very interesting and important process that's been unfolding over the last 30 years where you know, producers of commodities have you know, met certain requirements with respect to sustainability, land use and resource use, but also social sustainability and values. Those have been introduced in, in sort of later stages of the certification sort of development, kind of thinking about certification. And so here's where considerations of uh, social impact would, would come into the mix. You know, governments would be very concerned about that. Consumers would be concerned about it because you know, drivers of, of, uh, of these sort of pledges have been in markets. You know, and they're, you know, consumers in many large markets are as equally concerned about the social consequences as they are the environmental consequences, and increasingly so. Just to add to, obviously, you know, the consumers are driving this, you mm -hmm. know, in Europe and elsewhere. You know, they, they've actually, they, they made it happen, mm -hmm. you know, that the companies made these pledges. But mm -hmm. of course, they don't want to hear that, oh, as a result of our pressure and the, the pledges, now, you know, smallholders or rural people, whoever, are going to suffer, you know, because of, you know, because of the exclusion. So, f almost certainly, you know, the, the social uh, groups and NGOs, they, 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 they'll be pushing the governments, mm -hmm. in, like in Indonesia, I'm sure, to, to, to make sure that there are safeguards in place mm -hmm. to assist smallholders, to, to kind of speed up mm -hmm. the adoption of certification measures among smallholders and help them meet these zero deforestation criteria. Mm -hmm. um, uh, again, sort of learning from the uh, forestry sector, you know, uh, there's this, um, this, this group certification uh, possibility. There is also um, this self-declaration self sort of a, a concept uh, or jurisdictional level sort of uh, based um, approach to certification. So there are different ideas being explored to, 
to kind of more effectively um, implement uh, certification at, on, on a sort of wider scale. The landscape. Basis. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but, but this remains to be, you know, it, it remains to be seen how this is going to play out in the context of oil palm. R right now we don't know, but we, we can expect that uh, there's going to be a lot of pressure on the government to make sure that there is no excessive adverse effect on, on, on smallholders. Yeah. It, it seems from what you're saying that that is kind of one of the areas and the, the question I addressed to you before about kind of government involvement in trying to ensure that those people don't get edged out of, out of the picture. What kind of research is needed to be done to make sure that that production line, for instance, the one that you were talking to about before, kind of remains in place, but that the declaration is, is you know, the declaration works, that the aspects of the declaration that of deforestation actually works? Well, in my opinion, uh, one of the major basic things, uh, basic um, pieces of research that needs to be done, and I think some, it's a piece of research that we will be very sort of enthusiastically pursuing, uh, is a better understanding the small scale sector, oil palm sector, uh, wherever it is. Uh, of course, mostly we're talking about what do you mean? Sorry, what do you mean when you say the small-scale sector? Can you just define what a small-scale sector is? Oh, that, that be it's a becoming a bit tricky now. Uh, <laughs> um, we are talking about enterprises anywhere from two hectares to 150 hectares, or something like that. There has been a virtual explosion of those kinds of enterprises in Indonesia over the last five years. You know, mo most of the time when we talk about oil palm, we have this. You know, we had, people imagine large-scale monoculture concession, you know, plantations, thousands of hectares, which is the case. But in more recent uh, times, um, there's been a tremendous growth in this kind of small, small scale, what we call small-scale sector. And so um, th there are various estimates as to how big or how, you know, how large it is, how many people it involves. There are some so official statistics indicating that, indicating that uh, somewhere between three to four million people are involved in the, in, in, the, in, in this sector. If we include the kind of unregistered ones, it may be double, uh, double that. So anywhere seven to eight million people uh, or families in Indonesia. So, uh, but uh, if, you know, it's, it's, there's, there's some very basic piece of information that we don't have about this. You know, how large is it? Um, you know, how, how, it's, how is it distributed spatially? the working dynamics of this sector, the financing behind it, the sort of political economy of it, the management practices, uh, and also the links to the, 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 the value chain, the supply chains. Um, all these things uh, need, need to be better understood in order to, f uh, to understand how we can, you know, how we can safeguard these, these, uh, these smallholders and, and growers of oil palm you know, so they are not adversely affected by zero deforestation. From a government perspe perspective, Steve, the protection of those small holders is vitally important. It would be. I mean, any, any government would, would be concerned that, that, they, that they not be excluded. But the government has other interests in, in, in these pledges. And, uh, and, and Christoph alluded to one. I mean, what are the consequences, for instance, for economic growth? You know, if, if uh, if the adoption of the pledges means that there's less overall production of oil palm in the country for export, less government revenue associated with, with the sector, less maybe net employment as a result, then those are other questions. And in a sense, you know, Indonesia, for instance, is one of the leading uh, countries with respect to defore rates of deforestation. It now is the leading country uh, it just surpassed Brazil last year as the country with the highest rate of deforestation. And much of this is driven by you know, large scale, but increasingly you know, contribution from, from small scale producers, uh, oil palm and other sort of commodity production. And you sort of reduce that, then that has economic consequences. Well, you, it, there are some serious contrad <laughs> contradictions. I'm sort of smiling as I'm listening to you because in fact, uh, my sense is that the, 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 the government of Indonesia is kind of hard, uh, caught, caught in the middle. On one hand, they, they, yes, they would like to support the, this, the sustainability uh, agenda of zero deforestation. On the other hand, of course, they have this, you know, they are the leading producer and grower of oil palm, so they want to maintain that, uh, if not expand or strengthen that position. 
Uh, and then there's also there are these indeed contradictions in the sense that uh, if we look at the Indonesian law, indeed as it, as it stands now, zero deforestation is impossible, in fact, because companies legally are forced to, or are supposed to, develop their full concession area into plantation areas, and they're not supposed to be setting any sort of areas aside. Um, I mean, that, that's, you know, according to the, to the letter of, of the law. Um, so, so some parts of the legal framework would have to be changed as well if zero deforestation were to be implemented, like, fully, effectively. So, so there are some, definitely some contradictions, and uh, I th they, th they, they will need to be sorted out. Uh. Well, we started the conversation discussing how realistic you thought mm -hmm. the declaration was and is, and what aspects of it were more realistic than others. I'd like to end, I suppose, by just asking you, how would you judge the success, or how would the declaration be judged a success? Well, I think one of the simpler uh, measures of um, sort of um, um, success, I guess, would be to precisely what uh, Steve mentioned earlier, to keep an eye on the rates of deforestation in Indonesia. I mean, no matter how you look at it, oil palm is a major driver of deforestation. There are other drivers, but in other commodities, but oil palm by far is the leading one. So if there's any progress being made in that area, uh, you should you should you know you should see a, you should see a, a, a drop in, in the overall rates. Of course, understanding uh, the drivers on the ground that might be leading to uh, a reduction in rates of deforestation is, is something that we do here at C4. That's part of our, our research uh, mandate. Uh, so how how are these pledges uh, implemented is a is a key issue. But I think also, and I want to say how potentially important these pledges are because they represent what, what we're sort of characterizing as sort of a new element in the global forest governance architecture. Okay? Because traditionally and historically, forest governance has been the, the kind of responsibility of the state. You know, state governments tend to own the forests. They regulate their use through permitting uh, and enforcement rules uh, and so on. But in the last 20 or 25 years, and zero deforestation is the latest expression of this, We've seen kind of consumers voting, if you will, uh, uh, in ways uh, that have implications to how forests are used and how forest producers uh, are treated in, in, many, in many settings. And so this is another, we call this sort of non-state sort of governance regime, you know, that could conceivably, you know, if, if, if these practices take root, consumers continue and, and, and increasingly expect that the commodities that are produced are produced sustainably, then the potential for there to be significant benefits to the environment in terms of reduced deforestation, greater protection of biodiversity, uh, reduced greenhouse gas emissions uh, associated with deforestation. These can be quite significant benefits, maybe greater than some of the benefits realized through traditional government initiatives, being mindful that there's more that we can do on the government side as well. And just to reiterate what we said earlier, I think it will require some clear measures to, to kind of buffer or, or protect sm the smallholder sector. And then, you know, some, cle some, some specific uh, steps to, 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 you know, to modify the, the legal framework for, for plantation development in Indonesia. So the actual zero deforestation management practices can be, can be implemented. Um, so it will, you know, uh, it will take some, some modifications in the system and so on, but I think it, overall it has great potential to move along the sustainability agenda in the, f in the oil palm sector.